All right, chapter seven, <clears throat> we'll look at section one and section two. Tangential speed. We are going to be talking about circular motion. Um, I want to distinguish a little bit between circular motion and rotational motion so that we understand when we run across those two terms. If I have an object on the end of a string, like this one right here, that object, that rubber stopper, this bob down here, is moving in circular motion. Circular motion is when I am moving around a center point, just like a circle goes around a center point. Rotational motion, if you look at this turning table right up here, if it was on a table you might call it a lazy Susan, this is undergoing rotational motion. The whole object is rotating. It's also rotating about a point called its axis of rotation. If I set a mass on top of this, the tabletop here, my blue object, is rotating, but my weight up here is moving in circular motion. It's not rotating. Do you see the difference? This is circular motion, but this object is undergoing rotational motion. Tangential speed is the speed an object has that's undergoing circular motion. Not, rotation, not rotating or rotational motion, but circular motion. So this mass sitting on top has some sort of tangential speed in a linear unit, meters per second. So that could be related to a straight line speed. Tangential speed, V sub T, of an object in circular motion is the object speed along an imaginary line drawn tangent to the circular path. In a minute, we'll talk about this a little more. But if I am spinning this bob in circular motion and I let go at any point, this bob would move at in a path tangent to the circle it was moving in. Let me see if I can bring up something to draw on. So we are familiar with tangent. If I have a circle and I have my bob out here that was undergoing circular motion, it was rotating, it was spinning, wrong word, around like that. If I let go of that string, it would then move in a line tangent to that circle. So if I was spinning it around this direction, that bob would move in this straight line at that tangential velocity. That's why it's using the term tangential velocity to it. Back to our notes. Tangential speed depends on the distance from the object to the center of the circular path. Let's look at two objects up here. Make sure you can see my two masses that are sitting. Which of these, as I am rotating them, has a larger radius to their circular motion? The outside one. Are they moving at the same tangential speed? According to this, tangential speed depends on the distance from the object to the center of the circular path. And you correctly told me that this object has a greater radius than this object. Can you tell which one has a greater tangential speed? Which one? The outside one. I hope it's obvious that outside one is moving faster as far as how many meters per second that it is going through, much faster than the one that has a smaller radius. So that's what that point is saying right here. When the tangential speed is constant, the motion is described as uniform circular motion. So constant speed, it's uniform circular motion. Turn our voice on. 
car moving in a circular path experiences acceleration even when the speed at which it is traveling remains constant. This is because acceleration depends on velocity, and velocity is a vector with both magnitude and direction. When the car moves in a circle, the direction of the velocity vector is constantly changing. Therefore, the acceleration, or change in velocity over the change in time, is also changing. Acceleration of this nature is called a centripetal or center-seeking acceleration. When the radius decreases, the direction changes more quickly and the experienced acceleration is greater. When the radius increases, the direction changes more gradually and the experienced acceleration is not as noticeable. Acceleration is a vector quantity, meaning what? magnitude and direction to it. So even if I have something moving in uniform circular motion, like we have right here, I'm moving at a constant tangential velocity or constant tangential speed. That object is still accelerating because, why is it accelerating? It's changing direction, constantly changing direction. Now let's think back to Newton's second law. The only time you have an acceleration is when what is acting on it? A net force is acting on it. Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration, or if I solve for acceleration, directly proportional to a force, inversely proportional to a mass. It, the only time I have an acceleration is if there is a net force acting on it. So, which direction is the net force acting on this bob? Thinking about the string will help you. I'm spinning this bob around my head. What direction is the net force acting on this bob? Which way? Out from the string? Counterclockwise? I've already got it spinning, so once it's spinning, I don't have to keep pushing it. There's a hint on the clockwise or counterclockwise. What can you do with a string? Can you push a string and cause a force? So which direction must the net force be acting on this bob right now? I'm trying not to make it a hard question. What's the only way I can pull on this string? Inward, toward the center. That's the only thing I can do. I cannot, with the string, I cannot push it sideways. I cannot push into the string. What's the only thing I can do with the string? Pull. The only thing I can do, and again, I'm getting, I swing it, I get it started, but the only thing I can do up here is pull which direction on my string? Inward. That's all I can do is pull inward on the string. I think you agree when I set it down here. Can I go sideways with my string? No. Even if I have it tight, can I go sideways with my string? No, I can't. The only, and I can't push with my string. The only thing I can do is pull with my string. So when I have something accelerating, moving in circular motion, the only direction the net force is is directed towards the center. The force is directed toward the center. The acceleration is directed towards the center, this nice little purple arrow. So, and we call that acceleration, did you catch the word? It's not written on the board. Oh, it is written on the board. <laughs> it's called centripetal acceleration, like centripetal, centripetal acceleration, which means center-directed acceleration caused by a center-directed force. So anytime I have circular motion, I have a net force directed toward the center. That's the only force there is, is a force directed towards the center. We'll talk about some other things. I think this will bring it out, and if not, I'll bring it up. Acceleration of an object moving in a circular path at a constant speed is due to a change in direction. That's the acceleration, is the change in the direction. The acceleration is called centripetal acceleration. And here is the formula for centripetal acceleration. So our first formula to memorize from this new chapter. 
Notice it's A for acceleration again. We have sub C for centripetal. Tangential speed squared divided by the radius is going to be our centripetal acceleration. And this is going to be measured in meters per second squared like any other acceleration would be measured. Let's look at vectors for a minute and see how the change in direction results in a center-directed acceleration. If I can find my right one, there we go, that's the one I'm working on. Right up here, we have a bob first at position A, then at position B. And so during a change in, well, that's delta S, not a change in time. But as I move through time, it goes from position A to position B. At position A, its initial velocity is a tangent to that circle. Let me illustrate that for just a minute. If I am spinning this around in a circle above my head, and if I am real good, and if I let this bob go when it was exactly, the string was exactly parallel to this front wall, and I'm spinning it in this direction, whatever direction you want to call that, I guess it would be, I don't know, clockwise from below. Where will that bob go? If I let it go, I'm spinning it around like this. If I let it go when my string was exactly parallel to the front wall, which direction would that bob go? Would it end up at the clock over here at that poster, at that wall back there, straight over Jay Young's head, over towards Ashton, over towards Marco? Where would it go? Point at something around the room. Where would it hit? Point at some object so I know. Again, I'm spinning it like this. I'm going to let it go when that bob is directly here. The TV? Which wall? Where? Oh, the, right there? The, one, the wall right in front of me, which is right about the TV. The clock, did I hear? The hall pass about that area right over there? Maggie, I saw you point in a different direction. You want to say your idea? All right. We, we just want to get different opinions here. Let's try it out. Protect yourself there, Jay Young. I'm trying to get it now, 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 now. Which direction did it go? What? Perpendicular to what? To the string. That's exactly what I did. Perpendicular to my string. Tangent to that circle. That bob will move tangent to the circle. Because when I am twisting it, remember the force is directly towards me. As soon as I have known that force acting on it, Newton's first law says I'm going to continue to move in a straight line, correct? And as that is going around, the direction it's pointing is tangent to the circle at any point in time. So it will move exactly straight back. That's why I had pretty good confidence. Jay Young, you were a little bit in danger because if I missed it just a little bit, but I knew I wasn't going to hit anything over there, wasn't going to hit anything over there. It was going to move in this area pretty good because it has to be tangent to it. So at any point in time, the velocity is tangent. So if I move from point A to point B, B is my final. If I want, a, um, if I want the resultant vector, I'm going to add two vectors together. If I want, I should say, my change in velocity. If I want my change in velocity, I'm going to take my final velocity minus my initial velocity. So here's my final velocity, this vector. And my initial velocity is this vector right here. If I am subtracting a vector, I need to do the negative of the initial vector. 
So I happen to have a nice little purple one right here that I have made. That is just the same size, we grabbed the wrong thing, same size, but it is negative direction, if you can see it. So I'm going to put it at the end of this one right over here. Now it's not perfect, they didn't get a scale that's exactly perfect, but that little triangle is this little triangle over there. They have done end to end. And so the difference, my resultant vector, is going to be from beginning to end right over here. And that beginning to end is almost perfect on this picture, is directed right towards the center of that circle. My change in velocity, which is my acceleration. Acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. Acceleration, change in velocity over change in time. So my change in velocity as I move through time, I have a velocity resultant that is directed toward the center. That graphically is a vector addition for what is happening. So that's what they're talking about right over here. Delta V is directed toward the center of the circle. Centripetal acceleration is always directed toward the center of the circle. You've seen that centripetal acceleration results from change in direction. Circular motion, acceleration, due to a change in speed, is called tangential acceleration. Thank you for whoever got my ball back. If I have uniform circular motion, I am accelerating because I am changing direction. Now, I also, I'm not going to let it go. You're okay. I also can have um, acceleration from a change in tangential speed. I just accelerated it, and it's going faster. Or I can slow down. Both of those are acceleration due to a change in tangential speed. So I can have two kinds of accelerations going on in circular motion. I can have the change of direction one, and also the change in tangential speed one for acceleration going on. So acceleration due to change in speed is called tangential acceleration as opposed to centripetal acceleration. Understand the difference between centripetal and tangential acceleration. Consider a car traveling around a circular track. Because the car is moving in a circle, it has centripetal components. If the car's speed changes, you step on the brake to slow down as you go around, it also has a tangential component of acceleration. It's changing its tangential. A ball of mass m, or a bob of mass m, that has been whirled in a horizontal circular pass of radius r with constant speed, just like I was doing a minute ago. The force exerted by the string has horizontal, says, and vertical components. Now, why do I have a vertical component to it just a little bit? When I'm twirling it around, that string is not going to be exactly horizontal. It's going to dip down just a little bit. So when I'm pulling on it, let me illustrate a picture. So when that string is going around, here's my hand. One, two, three, four. All right, and my thumb over there. I'm hanging on to the string. That bob right out here is not going to be, bad picture, exactly horizontal as I am twirling it around. It's going to be down a little bit like this. It's not going to be exactly horizontal. Why isn't it going to be exactly horizontal? Because of gravity, pulling it down. Gravity is pulling that thing down. So it's not going to be exactly horizontal as I'm spinning that around. So that's what they are saying when this string is going to have a horizontal component. I'm pulling this direction. And there's going to be a little bit of a vertical component right there to it. So my force directed toward the center, it is directed toward the center, but it actually has a little bit of vertical component so that it can overcome gravity. That's what they are talking about here. The vertical component is equal and opposite to the gravitational force. Thus, the horizontal component is the net force acting on it. The other is just balanced out by gravity. This net force, which is directed toward the center of the circle, is the centripetal force. So here it is again. My string is kind of pulling up a little bit because gravity is pulling it down. But the vertical part of that component is going to cancel out with gravity. So my net force is just simply in, um, 
equal to this centripetal force, the one that's directed exactly horizontal towards the center of my circle. Newton's second law can be combined with the equation for centripetal acceleration to derive an equation for centripetal force. Newton's second law, F equals what? Mass times acceleration. So, since acceleration is tangential speed squared divided by radius, then I can use my force equals mass times centripetal acceleration, and there is my centripetal force equation. It's the same thing as Newton's second law of mass times acceleration, just mass times tangential speed squared divided by the radius. So I know how much force I have to apply to that string to make it go into a circle. Some of you have heard this term centrifugal, F-U-G-A-L, centrifugal force. Have any of you heard that term, centrifugal force? Some of you nodding your head, you've heard that term before. You maybe have even heard of an object called the centrifuge. When? Can you tell me any example of a centrifuge? You have heard that term. Anybody remember? You've heard the term, can't think of it. They will take blood, they will put it in a centrifuge, they will spin it to separate the different parts of the blood. That's a different science. Um, the different parts, red blood cells, white blood cells, I don't know what they have, plasma, whatever they separate in blood, whatever that stuff has in it. They will spin it in a centrifuge to help separate it. Have any of you gone to a state fair where they have this big rotating disc room that you get inside and you stand on the floor and then they start spinning it around like this and then the floor drops out and you're just plastered to the wall? That's about the time that I throw up. But <laughs> I've done that once as a kid and that was good enough for me. I don't ever need to do it again. Um, motion sickness is, comes real easy for me. That, often people will say, oh, what's holding you against the wall? And they'll say, it's centrifugal force, F-U-G-A-L, centrifugal force. Maybe you've heard that term, centrifugal force. Centrifugal force does not exist. There's not such a thing as centrifugal force. Then what's holding you against the wall? Exactly the question. What? <laughs> Huh? What's holding you against the wall? Centripetal force? Does that make sense, do you think? Centripetal force? Yes, I agree. That's what's holding you against the wall. If you are ever inside it, where do you, or imagine, do a thought experiment in your mind, where is that force? You're spinning around inside this big circular barrel. Where are you feeling the force? Right out against you. Here, here's the outside wall. Here I am. That outside wall is, now you may, you may feel yourself pushed out like this. The force you are really feeling is that wall pushing against you. Now, why does that wall push against you? Because of Newton's first law that says what direction does an object want to go in if there are no other forces acting on it? A linear straight line path. So here's what's going on. I have this big circular barrel that I happen to be unlucky enough. Here's my red hair. I'm uh, what? That's my, those are my feet down there. So you're looking at my head, okay? Here are my arms. There are my arms. So there I am, all right? Plastered against this wall. When I am moving, I want to move if that string breaks. I'm moving in a circular motion right here. I'm moving circular. But if I had nothing to make me go circular, which direction do I want to go? Perpendicular to the radius, we have a name for it. It starts with T. Tangent to that circle. I want to go tangent to that circle. So I want to go exactly like this. That's the direction I want to go if I am moving and this barrel thing, this big circular thing, was not there pulling me this direction. 
it's providing a centripetal force on me, pulling me this direction. Otherwise, I would go straight. Same thing happens when you're in a car, you're in one of those old cars that has a big bench seat. Maybe some of your grandparents still have one of those. Maybe your parents still have one of those cars that has this big bench seat in front. Anybody ever ridden? Man, those are getting so rare anymore. Anybody ever ridden in a vehicle? A pickup maybe still has some of those. A big bench seat, all right? And it's vinyl. So it's not cloth, not leather. The leather would work. It's kind of slick. It's vinyl. All these illustrations, they used to be so good, and now nobody rides in these vehicles, so they haven't experienced these big vinyl bent seats. And no seat belts, because we didn't used to worry about impaling ourselves on the steering wheel or with the glass on the front windshield when we had an accident. St um, seat belts were, you know, who needed seat belts? So you're in here without a seat belt, and you're on this road, and we won't name any names of who might be driving the car, so don't think of somebody. It makes a turn, and you happen to be sitting as some of us used to describe, this is a car. There's the roof of the car. See, here's the four wheels. Your car is going this direction. You happen to be out on a date, and you're kind of snuggled up close to your special person who's right over here. And that special person is driving kind of fast, and they come around the corner like this. What will you do as you're sitting in that seat with no seat belt and on the slick seat? You're going to be sliding out to that outside wall, right? And you hope the door is locked. Because if the door is not locked, which direction would you be going? Now, don't answer that you would be flying to the side of the road. What direction will you go? Tangent to that curve. In our mind, this is what we want to think. This is what we want to think right there in our mind. Ooh, I'm going to be flying out that door to the side of the road. You're not. You are moving in a straight line. The problem is the car is turning under you. So you are not turning. When you are not in a seatbelt, you are not turning when that car turns. The car is turning under you. You are going in a straight line. So there is no force shoving you to the outside. I know you think there is, but there's not. There's no force shoving you to the outside. In fact, you may be able to play it in your mind in a way you're kind of weightless. As you're sitting on that slick seat and the car turns under you, you're just sitting there weightless. You just swing to the outside because it's not really to the outside. You are here. You are going straight. That car is doing this. It is swinging to the left underneath you. You just keep on heading in the straight path. So there is not such a thing as this term centrifugal force. If you ever run across it, just smile. Don't say anything, but don't believe it. There's another argument there. Centrifugal force does not work. So how can we put blood in a centrifuge and have it separate the different things? Because they have different masses, they have different inertias. Inertia, Newton's first law. Inertia, we want to keep moving in a straight line. And so they will separate in a centrifuge, and I don't know how a centrifuge is made up. Maybe it has different little things. You pour the blood in, whatever it is. <clears throat> but thing, And maybe it has different size filters. I don't know how the things are made up. But what happens is you get in different regions, the different masses, parts of the blood, because of how much inertia it has and how much it wants to continue moving in a straight line, it will separate it more to the outside or more to the inside, depending on, again, its inertia, how much it wants to go in a straight line. All right, now that we have gotten rid of the myth of centrifugal force, there is not such a thing. There is only centripetal force. So, Brandon, your answer is absolutely correct. What makes you go, what sticks you to the outside wall? It's the centripetal force of that tube, of that barrel, that is pulling you in as you are wanting to go straight. Centripetal force, simply the name given to the net force on an object in uniform circular motion. Any type of force or combination of forces can provide this net force. For example, Friction between a race car's tires and a circular track is where the centripetal force comes from that keeps the car in a circular path. It is directed toward the center. 
Another example, gravitational force, centripetal force that keeps the moon in its orbit. No string there, it's just the gravitational force attracting the moon and the earth together. So, mentioned this a minute ago, if the centripetal force vanishes, the object stops moving in a circular path. It moves in a straight line, tangent to that circular path. Picture A, they're showing a vertical circle where the string breaks right when it is, oh, I can't draw on this, when it is coming up. And so, if that string is exactly horizontal when it breaks, it will continue moving straight up. If I have a vertical circle and it breaks exactly when it, the string is straight up, well, it moves horizontal, but why am I getting this nice little parabolic curve? Gravity is going to pull it down. Yeah, so gravity is still acting on that thing, but it's heads off tangentially. The ball is on the end of a string. It's whirled in a vertical circular path. String breaks at position A, will move vertically upward, tangent. And if the string breaks at the top, the ball will move along a parabolic path because of gravity is the only reason. Rotational systems, okay, to better understand the motion of a rotating system, that's where the whole object itself is doing its spinning about an axis, rotating about an axis. Consider a car traveling at high speed, approaching an exit ramp, curves to the left. As the driver makes a sharp left turn, the patchler slides to the right, hits the door. What causes the passenger to move towards the door? We already know this answer. What causes the passenger to move towards the door? Now, it's not centripetal force in this case. Once the passenger hits the door, the centripetal force will make that person turn. Inertia. What makes it hit the door? Inertia. That passenger wants to go straight. The car is moving under it. So what causes the board the outside? It's just the inertia of it. Faster because of inertia tends to move along the original straight path. So inertia from Newton's first law, we want to continue moving in a straight path. There is no force that moves you out. It's the car that's moving under you. Sufficiently large centripetal force acts on the passenger. The person will move along the same curved path that the car does. Which is why we want that door to be locked, or at least latched real well, so that it can produce a large enough force to make us turn with the car, so that we don't keep going in a straight path right out the door as the car moves under us. Origin of the centripetal force, friction between the passenger and the car seat. Well, I'm suspicious it's probably between your shoulder and the door that causes you to turn, but if this frictional force is not sufficient, the passenger slides across the seat. Oh, okay, if the friction isn't enough, then you slide across the seat as the car turns under Neath you. Let me see if there is anything else that I wanted to bring up in this first section. All right, nothing else in that first section. Second section. Gravitational forces. We have mentioned before that orbiting objects are in free fall. Have I mentioned that before? I don't know if I've mentioned, maybe I haven't mentioned that before this year. Orbiting objects are really in free fall. We'll illustrate this by a kind of a cool concept here in a minute. To see how this, is, is, this idea is true, we can use a thought experiment that Newton developed. Consider a cannon sitting on a high mountain. So here's our cannon. If I first shoot my cannonball with a low velocity, that cannonball in free fall goes out horizontally, fairly rapidly drops down to this nice parabolic path to hit the water. If I fire it a little faster, well, gravity is pulling it towards the center, but it goes a little farther before it drops and hits the water. If I fire it fast enough, now it is still curving this yellow line, as it is dropping towards the center, but if it is fast enough, its rate of drop will exactly match the curvature of the Earth. And it continues to fall, but the Earth continues to curve away from it at exactly the same rate. At that exact speed, we have a name for it. We call it orbital velocity. Anything that is orbiting is technically in free fall. 
that's really all that's happening. It is falling around the earth, always being pulled towards the center, always turning, curving towards the center of the earth. It is falling towards the center the whole time. But it is moving so fast that its rate of drop towards the center as it moves forward simply just keeps up with the curvature of your object that you are orbiting about. And so you are in free fall. And if I am in free fall, let's climb in an elevator for a minute, and let's start to go down, and then the cable breaks, as well as all the safety mechanisms, and we go in free fall. I feel weightless in there. Why? Because the elevator is falling at the same rate that I'm falling. I'm weightless. When you are on the International Space Station, you are weightless. It's called apparent weightlessness. Why are you weightless? Because the International Space Station is in free fall with you. You are both in free fall, just like in the elevator you are both falling at the same rate around the Earth. That's why they feel weightless. Not because gravity has disappeared. What would happen to the orbiting space station if the gravity of the Earth disappeared? It would just keep moving tangent to wherever it was in a straight line through space. It would just keep moving in a straight line, just like that bob on the end of the string. The gravity is the centripetal force pulling it towards the center as it's curving around. And it is in free fall. Orbiting objects are free fall. Weightlessness from being in space is not because you are weightless or there's no gravity. It's because your net forces are zero. You're in free fall when you are going around. Centripetal force that holds the planets in orbit is the same force that pulls an apple towards the ground. It's gravitational force. Gravitational force, the mutual force of attraction between particles of matter. Now this concept is actually more difficult than what it seems on the surface. Where does this force of gravity come from? Well, our answer is anytime there is mass, you have gravitational force. I believe I have mentioned when we have Luis, who's wide awake, when we have Luis, who is a mass, and he's sitting right in front of Marco, who's now wide awake. There is a gravitational force of attraction between them, between Luis and Maggie, a gravitational force of attraction between them. Very small compared to the gravitational force between Luis and the Earth. Not good enough that you can get out of ad council by saying, the reason we're stuck together is because gravitational force. I couldn't do anything about it. Yes, you could. That gravitational force is extremely weak between two very light masses. But between me and the Earth, it's pretty strong. And the older you get, the stronger that gravity becomes. I can get at least eight inches off the floor now. Anyway, um, what makes the magnitude of the force of gravity, do you think, from what I've just been talking about? What determines how strong gravity is, this gravitational force? mass, how much mass is there. The more massive an object, the more gravitational force there is. So, between myself, which has a little bit of mass, and the Earth, which has a whole bunch of mass, that's where that gravitational force comes from. Why is there a force there? What's actually doing the pulling? I don't know if you've ever thought of these field forces. But when I have two magnets, we know what's going to happen if I have a north and a south pole. They are going to come together. Have you ever wondered, what's, I need three hands, what's between here? What's between here that is causing that force? That's a good question that as we get way in the end, way in the end of physics, what is physically going on that causes these two things to move together? In our experience, the only way things are going to move is when there's really something touching. What is touching? How can this thing see this thing? I know I'm using human terms, but I don't know how else to explain it. So that all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's something else there, and I need to start doing this. These field forces, including gravity, what's going on there? We have a particle that we call the graviton that we think is involved in this thing. 
but it's really very interesting when you get into the quantum physics, which is simply the subatomic size, the um, atomic particle size stuff that we talk about. Gravitational forces depend on the masses and on the distance between them. The farther away I get from Earth, the less gravitational pull there is on me. If some of you want to lose weight, I have an easy solution. Just get in anything that takes you farther away from the center of the Earth, and you have lost weight. Weight is a gravitational force. Climb a tree. You have lost weight. Now, it'll be a little hard to measure the weight loss, but the difference between sea level and the top of Mount McKinley in Alaska, whatever that is, 19,000 feet, I think, whatever it is, that's actually measurable by stuff that we have. There's less gravitational pull. You're farther away from the center. Now, the only problem with that little illustration that I just used with climbing a mountain is, since gravitational force is involved with the masses, well, you've added the mass of this mountain that you're right on there. So it kind of helps balance it out just a little bit. But climb a tree or get in a hot air balloon, even better, and start floating up. You will lose weight because the gravitational force will be less. Now, your mass doesn't change, unfortunately, but you have lost weight as you go away. So the farther away I am between the center of the masses, the less that force is going to be. Newton again came up with this, and the famous thing is when he was sitting on, under an apple tree and an apple hit him on his head and he had this eureka moment. I don't know. Here's the formula. Gravitational force. There's this big G called the universal gravitational constant. It is a value that makes these equations balance is what it is. It was found experimentally, and it's a number that your book probably should uh, There it is. There's that number. You'll use it a decent amount. I won't make you memorize that number. You'll be able to look it up or something. Directly proportional, let's look at this, to the masses. Notice we're multiplying the masses together. We're directly proportional. So one mass goes up, the gravity force goes up. The other mass goes up, gravity force goes up inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. R is for our distance away I am from the center of the Earth or whatever the other mass is. So let me ask a simple question. If I double the distance, how much have I reduced the force? Just think a minute about the R. If I double the distance, how much have I reduced the force? Not by half. What do I do at that distance? I square it four times, two squared. I square it. If I double the distance, four times reduction in force. Triple the distance, nine times reduction in force as I get away from something else. Sir Isaac Newton realized that the force of gravity makes a small object, like an apple, fall toward Earth because Earth and the object are attracted to one another. Only the apple appears to move, however, because Earth has so much more mass. In Newton's law of universal gravitation, he explained that all objects in the universe attract each other through gravitational force. The mass of the objects and the distance between them affects the size of the force. Newton's law states that the force of gravity depends on the product of the masses of the objects divided by the square of the distance between them. In other words, if two objects are moved twice as far apart, the gravitational attraction between them will decrease by a factor of 2 times 2, which equals 4. So, the gravitational attraction between two objects moved twice as far apart will be 4 times less. Do you remember when we took Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, and Newton's third law, that if there's a force acting on one object, there's an equal and opposite force acting on another object, and talked about us accelerating the Earth. When I jump up, the Earth accelerates me back down towards it. Do I accelerate the Earth back up towards me?
Yes, I accelerate the earth back towards me. Newton's third law says for every force, there's an equal and opposite force, reaction force. So when I push down to jump up, I'm pushing the earth away from me, as well as the earth is pushing me away from it. And when I'm up here suspended in the air, gravity is from the earth pulling me back down towards the earth. We see that very quickly. I go back down. But the earth is also accelerating towards me. By how much? Same acceleration? <laughs> uh -huh. Well, we could get a rough calculation. I don't know the answer to that one, but force equals mass times acceleration. So if I am talking about the acceleration of the Earth, I'm going to divide it by mass here, the force I apply divided by the mass of the Earth, I want to know how much this Earth is accelerated towards me. Now the force I apply on the Earth is the same that the Earth applies on me. What force? It's called our weight. How do I get that force, my weight? Mass times something. Acceleration due to gravity. You take the mass of me times the acceleration due to gravity. Mass of the Earth. And I can figure out how much the Earth is accelerating. Well, what's my mass? Well, let's say my mass happens to be 90 kilograms, and we're accelerating towards the Earth at 9.81 meters per second squared. I guess I didn't need that. And I need to divide it by the mass of the Earth, your book, back of the book, I think, back cover, they have a whole bunch of values just right inside the back cover. What's the mass of the Earth? Twenty-fourth. So take 90 times 9.81, divide it by 5.97 times 10 to the 24th. times 10 to the negative what? 22nd? Is the Earth accelerating back towards me? Yes. At what rate? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 1, 4, 8. There is how the Earth is accelerating back towards me. Because it is so massive, its acceleration is so minute that we're not going to measure that thing. My instruments don't have that many significant figures out there to find that end thing down there. But it is accelerating back towards me. There's a mutual acceleration that is going on. Just the magnitude of it is very small because its mass is so big. So, in answering your question, Ashton, if we get all the people around, well, there's the idea. So, um, are you doing that right now? Let's say the average, the average person is 90. How many people? What's the population of the whole Earth? What is it? 7 billion. So, let's take 90 times 7 billion. That would be 7 with how many zeros? Nine zeros times 9.81 and divided by our Earth, 5.97 times 10 to the 24th, was that the number? What do we get? I don't know. What do we get? What if we got all the people on the Earth and we averaged them to 90 kilograms, which is about 200 pounds? What is it? We've moved it up to the negative 12. There's your answer. Well, you're still not going to notice it. Not really. Even if we took every person on Earth and every person averaged about 200 pounds, then still, not really. But that was a good question. Is it going to see? And now we know, ah, no. The gravitational forces that two masses exert on each other are always equal in magnitude. They're just in opposite directions. So I'm pulling the Earth up, the Earth is pulling me down. The Earth is accelerating towards me. So that's the problem. When you're out there playing basketball and coach is saying, jump, you're saying, 
I did, but the earth keeps moving up towards me. I can't do anything about it. I don't know how far you'll get with that, but example of Newton's third law of motion, equal and opposite reaction to it. So our Earth-Moon system over here, we're going to see that on the next slide, our Earth-Moon system. As a result of these forces, the Moon and the Earth each orbit the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system. We know that the, here's the Sun, my left hand, here's the Earth right over here. We'll get the Moon in a minute. There's the Moon at the end of my pinky. I have the Earth going around the Sun. My Moon is also going around the Earth. But they are together moving in. It's not really circular. It's an elliptical path. But if you look at it, it looks circular because it's so close to circular. But it's really elliptical. Pre-calc, we'll actually graph those out later. All right. So we rotate around over here. And the center of my orbiting path is really the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system. Now, the Earth is much more massive than the Moon, so that Earth mass center is actually within the, within the Earth. Now, it's not at the center of the Earth. It's moved over towards the Moon a little bit, where the center of that Earth mass system, Earth-Moon mass system is. And our sun is in free fall around the center of our galaxy. And our galaxy, now I don't know if I can make this next statement, is in free fall around the center of the universe. As soon as I say that, anybody with, with cosmology, um, there's not a center of the universe, according to our understanding. These are one of these blow your mind things like infinity. There's not a center. How can we have something and not have a center to it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but there's not a center of the universe. But anyway, so here we have, we have the force of the um, moon on the Earth, which is the centripetal force for the force of the moon on the earth, which is the centripetal force of the earth being pulled towards the moon. You get the idea. And the opposite happens right over here. The center of the system, the mass center of the system, is not the center of the earth. It's moved over a little bit. I don't know where it is. It's still within the radius of the earth, but it's moved over a little bit to the moon. And that's the center that actually is the orbital path that if we graphed it, that it would be um, following. Ah, let's do something else before we get on to tides. Brandon just read us a number from the back of the book that was the mass of the Earth. Now let me ask you a question. Who went out there with a scale and got the mass of the Earth? How do you find the mass of the Earth? Where do we get this 5.97? What was that formula? The force due to gravity is universal gravitational constant. Help me out. There you go. Okay. We can calculate the mass of the Earth. It's not very hard. The force due to gravity of me on the Earth. You told me just a minute ago, it's called our weight. How do I calculate my weight? Mass times acceleration due to gravity. So I am mass 1, and I'm accelerating little g, acceleration due to gravity. That's my left side. Big G, m sub 1, m sub 2, divided by r squared. Now, I hate to say this, but you can even get rid of me, and I'm not important in this formula. It's gone. I am now going to solve for mass sub 2. That's going to be my Earth. So mass sub 2 is my Earth. So if I want to solve for that, here is a fraction, so I'm just going to multiply by the reciprocal. I'm going to take the acceleration due to gravity. I'm going to multiply by the radius squared. That's the distance between me and the center of the Earth, divided by the universal gravitational constant. Well, we know acceleration due to gravity, 9.81. The r, how far away am I from the center of the Earth? The radius of the Earth. Back flyleaf of your book again. What is it? 
6.38 times 10 to the what number? Six meters. Okay, so we're in the right unit. We're in meters per second squared here for acceleration. We're in meters right over there. Divide it by, oh, squared. Square that value. Divide it by the universal gravitational constant. I can't, I haven't used it enough since a year ago. What is it? 6.73? 6 6 Negative 11? Stick that in your calculator. Uh, what was the number that Brandon read to us a minute ago? 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Well, it's dealing with rounding. 24. 24th. There you go. We can get the mass of the Earth because we figured out acceleration of objects due to gravity. We can measure it. We can do it in our lab. We've got cool little stuff. We can measure it. We know our mass. And where does this universal... I'll get your question. Where does this universal gravitational constant come from? Oh, good question. Where does that thing come from? Turn to page 235 in your book. Up here, Henry Cavendish, Cavendish's experiment. He had a bar with two masses on the end of that bar suspended from a thread from something that was non-twisted, so it didn't have any torque to it. And then he had some other masses, you notice right over there, and he measured the force of attraction between. It would twist those towards that mass, the force of attraction. And so from experiments with different masses, he calculated the constant that would make these equations equal. That's where it came from. That's where that big G, initially, that's where it came from, that big G value. And they have perfected it, I am sure, since then. But it is simply a number that makes this equation work based on experimental data. And so that's how we get the mass of the Earth, because we figured out gravitational forces from other things, and then we just apply it to the Earth and rearrange our equation. We got the mass of the Earth. So we don't need a big scale at all in order to get the mass of the Earth. Tides. Tides are caused by what? Gravitational force. <coughs> of the moon, essentially. Now, what is a tide? Some of us have never lived by the ocean, but I think you're familiar with a tide. Um, usually a couple times a day, then the water's going to come in, and you have high tide, and go out, and you have low tide. On what page are you on there, Matt, with those pictures of the boat? Oh, yeah, right across the page from where we were looking. Look at that low tide and a high tide illustration. Some areas, they are huge differences. The Bay of Fundy in uh, Nova Scotia, I believe, it's in Canada, I think it's in Nova Scotia, is famous for the feet difference between high and low tides, huge differences. So what is really going on? The heaviest influence is the Earth-Moon gravitational forces that are going on here. It says the tides result from the difference between the gravitational force at the Earth's surface and the Earth's center. What in the world are they talking about? Let's look at a little video so we can see tides. I have a few people that I have favorited on my YouTube channel because they have cool stuff. And this guy right here, for many, many years that does this, his name is something Hewitt, um, but he taught at a community college out in, in Hawaii when they taped, I have a whole bunch of these DVDs, Saturday night, I'll check them out to you, you guys can watch them, they're cool, they're physics DVDs, but anyway, um, he made these things, and he since has put a whole bunch, he's retired now, but he has put a whole bunch of his illustrations of physics concepts on YouTube. Um, and so if you look up, what is it? Hewitt drew it. That's not the name of his thing. But anyhow, if you look up that, you can find it and you can favorite him too. So that you know where to find all these cool videos. What's 
centuries, people have wondered about the role of the moon on ocean tides. Here's the moon in empty space. Not quite so empty, for in its vicinity, let's suppose there's a giant blob of water. For the moment, we'll assume both are at rest. If no external forces act on the giant blob, it's pulled inward by both surface tension and its own gravity to take the shape of a sphere, the shape having the least surface area. But there are external forces on the water. The moon exerts gravitational forces on the blob and forces that are not uniform. Since the force of gravity between two bodies varies as the inverse square of their separation distance, the moon pulls harder on the parts of water closer to the moon than on parts farther away. If the body of water is closer to the moon, the elongation is more pronounced. Not only are the forces greater, more importantly, the difference in forces between the closest and farthest parts is greater. Opposite sides of the blob seem to be stretched apart. Let's move the water back a bit and put planet Earth in the middle of it. And let the planet spin, say, one rotation each day looking down on the North Pole and watching Earth rotate, an observer at the seashore notices that the water is deep here, a high tide, oh, notice the water is becoming less deep, and here we're at low tide, the best time to dig clams at the beach. Then the water begins deepening again, and before you know it, we have another high tide. The cycle continues. This computer animation makes this clearer. Nearer the moon, we see a greater stretch. Put a solid body inside the blob, move it out a bit, and here we see a North Pole view of Earth rotating daily beneath the ocean bulges. So with each rotation of Earth, we get two high tides and two low tides. So we see how Earth is elongated by the difference in lunar poles on it. The elongation is on opposite sides of Earth, so it doesn't make sense to think that the elongation is only on the side of Earth that faces the moon. A corresponding elongation occurs on the moon as well, even though it's solid. Consider the elongated moon as a drawing, very much exaggerated to help me explain an age-old question. Why does only one side of the moon face us? The moon, like all bodies that rotate, rotates about its center of mass, shown by this purple dot. Here's a situation where the center of mass and the center of gravity don't coincide. Because one side of the moon is closer to the Earth than the other, the close side is more gravitationally tugged toward Earth than the farther away side. This results in moon's center of gravity being somewhat closer to Earth than its center of mass. I draw this with the red dot. And a purple dot for Earth's center of mass. This red vector from the moon's center of gravity is the gravitational force that Earth exerts on the moon. The moon's long axis through both its centers of mass and gravity is shown by this white dashed line. The result is a torque about the moon's center of mass which tends to rotate the long axis of the moon into alignment with Earth's gravitational field. We see the same behavior with a compass needle that aligns with a magnetic field. Once aligned, the torque no longer exists. The alignment of moon's long axis continues as the moon circles Earth. We say the moon is tidal locked to Earth. How about that? Now, getting back to ocean tides. It so happens that the sun also plays a role in ocean tides. Because of its vast distance from Earth, the difference in its poles on near and far sides of Earth are much less than moon's difference in poles. Although less than half as effective as the moon in raising tides, sun's influence is there because it's so massive. Most noticed when the sun, moon, and Earth are aligned. Here we see the moon in its new moon position. Tidal influences of sun and moon coincide when this alignment occurs, producing extra high high tides and six hours later, extra low low tides. At times when the alignment is perfect, so the moon casts a shadow on Earth, we have a solar eclipse. The 
but that's another story. These greater than average tides are called spring tides, although they have nothing to do with the spring season. Spring tides occur at or near the time of a new or a full moon. When the moon is not in line with the sun, when it's positioned at 90 degrees to the line between sun and earth, tides due to the moon and sun partly cancel each other. That occurs when an observer on earth sees a half moon in the sky. How do you think tides are affected at this time of month? Did you say small or high and low tides then? If so, you're correct. These tides are called deep tides. Our treatment of tides is simplified. Average high tides are only a meter or so above the average surface of the ocean. So the bulges we depict are greatly exaggerated. And why the tidal bulges don't line exactly with the moon or sun, why they don't occur at the same time each day, and why variations in tides occur in different parts of the world, these all make up another story, a fascinating one. When we study physics, we try to simplify the story to, here's the basic idea of what's going on. Everything in this world, there's a deeper story. And when you start getting deeper, there's more to the background of what's going on here. But I think, hopefully, you can get a general concept. We get the two bulges because gravitation pulls different amounts. The closer they are, the stronger it pulls. So it just bulges out the body of water and the Earth is inside that body of water. And when the moon lines up 90 degrees, and they kind of cancel each other out. Spring tides and neap tides, I don't know. If you live by the ocean, you hear those terms a lot. If you've never lived by the ocean, you don't hear those terms a lot. But there's a little bit of an explanation of it. Cavendish, we saw a little picture there in your book about Cavendish and how he's the first one that figured out the value of G and Earth's mass, then just how we did it. Two masses, distance between them, gravitational force is known. Newton's law of universal gravitation can be fault, find to value to find that big G. Then we can use the universal gravitational constant, big G, and we can find the Earth's mass. We did it just a second ago. Field forces. Force due to gravity divided by mass is the acceleration due to gravity. That's just Newton's second law again rearranged is all that is. Field strength is free fall acceleration, gravitational field strength, free fall acceleration. Vectors representing the forces, the farther out you get, the smaller that force is going to be on you because you're getting farther and far away from that center of mass. Weight, mass times gravitational field strength. Your weight changes with location. We talked about that earlier. So right over here, they have just taken their weight is mass times gravity, and they've rearranged it in to figure out, where was it? Oh, gravitational acceleration. We rearranged this to figure out the mass of the Earth a little bit ago. You can get gravitational acceleration the same way, instead of experimentally. You don't need to memorize that. It's just using that same formula. So the value of gravitational acceleration depends on the mass of the object you're on and how far away you are from the center of that, the radius of that object. So that is why the moon has less gravitational acceleration. It's less massive. Even though you're closer to the center, it's smaller. The less mass outweighs the closer to the center that you happen to be. I want to look at another topic in your book, which is on page, where'd it go? 233. There are several, I hope you guys read when you're running across in the book, you read one of these physics on the edge things or something like that. I hope that you take the time to read those. And actually, let me come back to that. I want to make sure I have some examples for you. And then we'll come back to um, those black holes so that you can see these. 35 kilogram child travels in a circular path, radius of 2.5 meters as she spins around on a playground merry-go-round. She makes one complete revolution every 2.25 seconds. What is her speed or her tangential velocity? They say, hint here, find the circumference to get the distance traveled. We know velocity, any velocity, what's the simple definition of velocity? 
distance divided by time, or displacement divided by time, delta x over delta t. And so if I want to know the distance she has traveled, well, I need to get the circumference of that circle to get the distance she travels as she goes around this circle, as she goes around this merry-go-round. What's the circumference formula? There's my radius on my circle. Circumference equals Anybody remember their geometry? Pi r squared's area of a circle? 2 pi r. 2 pi r. That's going to be my circumference. That's going to be my distance traveled all the way around, my delta x. 2 times pi times r. There's my distance traveled. One complete revolution every 2.25 seconds. That's how long it takes her to go one time around. So what's her velocity, her tangential speed? I'll let you help me. Oh, I'm asking for the number, but I need to put in my radius too, don't I? A radius of 2.5. So just displacement over time. Distance traveled, which is circumference, and the time was 2.25 seconds. 6.98? Yes? 6.98 meters per second. So that's how fast Susie Q is going around on this merry-go-round. What is her centripetal acceleration? Well, do we have a formula for centripetal acceleration? What is it? There we go. So if I take my tangential speed, 6.98 meters per second, we're going to have to square that. We're going to divide it by our radius, which is 2.50 meters. We are going to get the acceleration. How much? 19.5? 19.5. Acceleration would be units. Meters per second squared. So there's our acceleration. What kind of acceleration is this? Centripetal acceleration. It's not tangential acceleration. That would be speeding up, going around the circle faster or slower. That would be tangential acceleration. We're moving at this constant velocity. So that is my tangential acceleration, which is the acceleration directed towards the center. What centripetal force is required to maintain this circular motion? What's our formula? Mass times centripetal acceleration. Tangential speed squared over radius. It's still just Newton's second law. So I can, since I already know that number, I can just multiply it by the mass of our kiddo. How much mass? 35 kilograms. So we have 35 kilograms, and we already figured out our acceleration was 19.5. So how much force takes it to bring that person in? 682. What would our unit be on this? Force. Newtons. Newtons of force. There is something that may come up for you. Let's look right over here. I have a child going around the centripetal acceleration towards the center, or centripetal force towards the center. If they also happen to be speeding up or slowing down tangentially, so I have a tangential acceleration, and you're asked for what's the total acceleration of this child, well, I have to combine these two things. I have a tangential acceleration speeding up, and it's tangent perpendicular to the centripetal acceleration. So my total is the combination beginning to end a right triangle. Pythagorean theorem would be used to get the total acceleration of that child. In our example, we only had centripetal acceleration. That was the total. But if the child also was speeding up or slowing down, we'd have to do a Pythagorean theorem relationship to get the total acceleration of that child. Let's look at one more example down here. Find the gravitational force that Earth exerts on the moon when the distance between them is 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters. 
Ah. So our gravitational force, F sub G, what's that formula? Universal gravitational constant divided by distance between them squared. So universal gravitational constant, six point, was it negative 11th? Negative 11th. Mass of one object, what do we have? The Earth, 5.97 times 10 to the 24th. Our other object is the moon, 7.35 times 10 to the 22nd. And the distance between them is 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters. And that has to be squared. Don't forget that squaring, like I almost did. So what's the gravitational force that Earth exerts on the moon to hold it in orbit? Anybody else? That, sound, that doesn't sound right, does it? 1.98? One point nine eight. One point nine nine times 10 to the 20 what? 20th? Now that sounds more reasonable. I have two people. I'll go with that one. Find the strength of the gravitational field at a distance of a point that is 3.84 times 10 to the 8th meters from the center of the Earth. I'm going to leave that one so that we can look at the black holes. Turn to page 233 in your book. I hope you've at least heard the term black hole, and you may know something about black holes. Brandon, would you read that first paragraph that starts, A black hole? Thank you, Allie. Escape velocity. If I want to send a rocket to the moon and escape the Earth's gravitational pull, if I don't escape it, all I'm doing is orbiting. The International Space Station is going at it at a velocity where it will just continue to fall around the Earth or orbit the Earth like this. If I want my object to escape, it's got to be going faster so that I can break Earth's gravitational field and head off somewhere towards the moon or something like that. And she read whatever that number was, the escape velocity. Um, Brianna? So, if we have an object so massive with a small radius that its gravitational force is so strong that the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light, and since our understanding, nothing can move greater than the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, then even light cannot get out. Or there is a certain radius away where anything closer to that just gets sucked in. That Schwarzschild radius, or sometimes, did they say event horizon? I think they used that term, didn't they? 
this is the horizon. Often we say it's the event horizon. This horizon means anything inside of that is going to be sucked in. Anything outside of that, it will be tremendously changed in its trajectory, but it can go around it. And so if nothing can come out, including light, the absence of light is darkness, hence black hole. You only see light if that light comes out and hits your eye. The only way I see something, and we'll get to optics later on, but the light is traveling into my eye. And so if all the light is being sucked in, then there's nothing coming out of it. I see nothing. So it's black inside there. Black holes have been a long-standing physics reality from evidence. I just read an article about three weeks ago that questioned whether black holes even exist or not. So there is debate in everything in physics based upon our understanding. But that's the idea of a black hole, that it is such a strong gravitational pull, nothing, including light, gets out of it. We think, if black holes exist, which most physicists still think they do, there is a black hole at the center of our galaxy where we are just part of a little solar system among, among a whole bunch of other solar systems in our galaxy. We think that is the thing that our galaxy is orbiting around, that massive black hole that's at the center of it. I don't know, but it's interesting stuff to read about. All right, I'll let you work. Sorry I didn't have very much time left, but I'll let you work it a little bit. The problems hopefully aren't too hard from this section.